Christ is risen. Amen. He is risen indeed. So good to see you. It's so good to worship uh, with you. My name is Michael White. If you don't know me, I serve as the lead pastor here. I do most of the preaching and teaching. We're a church led by a plurality of guys. Uh, we think that's wise and, and biblical. Uh, spreads out leadership responsibilities. We've got uh, several staff pastors and, uh, and then more lay pastors that, uh, that serve and lead this congregation. So, uh, But we are thankful that you are here, especially if you're a guest in town visiting family or just here because it's Easter and you, you wanted to, to, uh, to worship Jesus somewhere this morning. We are super glad and excited that you are here. We're going to be in John 11 uh, this morning if you want to begin turning there. So we live in a remarkable age, don't we? Really, when you think about it, the, the technological advances that we've seen in the, in the modern West over the last, I don't know, 125, 150 years have really changed the way that we live, honestly. They've opened up opportunities that, that most people in history could only have dreamed of, really and truly. They dreamed of these things. Just think about some of the things that we have. We can now, we can now travel to the other side of the world in a matter of, in some cases, hours, I mean many hours, right, or, or, or days, right? But we can get there quickly the modern transportation. We, we live, even right now, in climate-controlled comfort, right? <laughs> Both here and in our homes and in our vehicles. Climate control, air condition, heat, it's very, very nice, right? We can, we can carry on live video conversations, right, with, with, from the palms of our hands, right? Whip these out, FaceTime, Skype, whatever, Google Talk, whatever you want to use, right? You can do it. You can, you can have a video conversation with someone anywhere in the world. Think, think more about, about this one. 150 years ago, if I wanted to enjoy in my home or in my life, if I wanted to enjoy music, I would have had to have been extremely wealthy. If I wanted to enjoy music, I would have had to, to pay some live musicians to come and to, to play for me. If I wanted to, to host a party and for there to be music there, I'd have to, to, to pay these, these people to come and, and play. And then revolutionary technology entered, right? The phonograph was invented. And all of a sudden, music could fill our homes or, or any space. And then from the phonograph, eventually became the record player, right? And then became you know, eight-track uh, cassettes and cassette tapes and compact discs. And, and now all that technology, for, for those probably here who are under the age of 20, it's like, what are you even talking about? No, I just, I just download it, right, from iTunes, or I just stream it on Spotify or Apple Music, right? All of a sudden, we can listen to any song almost in the history of man in the palm of our hands. I mean, my kid's like in the car, right? <laughs> Daddy, can we listen to this? I'm like, sure, no problem. I can DJ it for you. They're spoiled, right? Nowhere has just the technological innovation impacted probably the way we live more than in the practice of medicine. And I understand, like, we could gripe and complain about various aspects of, especially our American healthcare system, uh, especially the insurance side of that, right? So I, I get that. But the reality is, is that within a very short drive, any of us here could receive better medical care than the richest person in the world could have received 75 years ago. We can go and there, there are x-rays and CT scans and MRIs to non-invasively diagnose problems with us with great accuracy. There's laparoscopic and, and robotic surgeries, right, that can be done to minimize uh, recovery and, and damage done. There's an amazing array of, of pain medications that allow excruciating pain to be minimized or at least kept at somewhat manageable levels. There, there's transplants and there's prosthetics and there's biomechanical things going on that can be put in our bodies to keep us alive. Unintentional infant mortality is down exponentially over the last hundred years. It's just amazing the advances that we've seen in modern medicine. But for all the, the progress that medicine has made, and for all the other progress that's happened in society, there's one place that there has not been any progress, and that is against death itself. Death is an undefeated opponent. It has a perfect blemishless record. While all of our best medical technology can delay death, and praise God, it, it often does. Technology, though, has no hope of, of, of ultimately defeating death. If you listen to the medical community, there's optimistic hope about curing HIV, curing cancer, curing Alzheimer's. 
But if you listen, nobody ever talks about let's cure death. It's because it can't be done. It can't be done through modern technology. But today, church, as we gather in this place, we are celebrating the death of death. Because as we gather here this morning, there's a tomb somewhere over in the Middle East that's empty. There's a tomb that Jesus walked out of because as the scripture said, it was impossible for death to hold him and because he himself is the resurrection and the life. Jesus walked out of that tomb, Colossians 1 says, as the firstborn from the dead, meaning that there were gonna be other people who were second and third and fourth and fifth and on down the line born from the dead. As he walked out, he was a visible announcement to the world that death's cruel reign was over and proof of everything that he had been saying. Because when a dead man walks and a dead man lives, you better listen to him. And what did he say? He said, whoever believes in me would never taste the true bitterness of death. And so church, we gather here this morning, this Easter Sunday, to celebrate these great truths. And to do that, we're going to walk through one of the great pictures of this triumph. Not one of the resurrection narratives, but a time in which Jesus brought a man back to life as a pointer to his own resurrection. And that's what we see in John chapter 11. We see that Lazarus is resurrected. And as we're looking at this story today, here's the thing I want you to take away. I want you to just see the incredible implications of this story for you and for me. And it's this. That because Jesus is the resurrection and the life, that's what he's going to say in this text. Because Jesus is the resurrection and the life, we are freed to live both now and forever. It's massive. Jesus' resurrection and the fact that he is the life changes life for you and for me. And so we're going to read, just to tell you, we're going to read a lengthy, lengthy portion of scripture today debated about whether or not to abbreviate it or not. We're just going to read the whole thing, all right? I want you to get the whole sense of how the whole story hangs together, and then we're going to go back and walk through uh, the details. So I invite you to follow along with me as I read from John 11. We're going to go down to verse 44. If you don't have a Bible, I encourage you. It's probably one in the seat in front of you, or maybe the seat that you're sitting in underneath your seat. So I encourage you to grab that and follow along. The words will also be on the screen. Here now, this is God's word for us as people. John 11. Now, a certain man was ill. Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. We'll see that in chapter 12. So the sisters sent to him, sent to Jesus, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It's for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. And then after this, he said to his disciples, let's go to Judea again. Disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. Are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. And after saying these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if, if he's fallen asleep, he'll, he'll recover. Now, Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest in sleep. So then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us go also that we may die with him. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and to Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met with him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. 
Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to to him, "I, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God who is coming into the world. And when she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when Mary heard it, she rose quickly and she went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit. And greatly troubled. And he said to and he said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, Could could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by, by this time there'll be an odor for he's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And so they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you will always hear me, but I I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who had died came out, his hands and his feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. This is God's word. Let's pray. Lord, indeed, we give you thanks because you are the God that wakes the dead. You are the God that walked out of your own tomb and secured a life for all who would believe in you. And so on this day of all days, God, would you give us joy in the gospel, joy in what you have done And God, would you help us even to see how what you have done in the gospel transforms our life, allows us to live differently, to go forward as resurrection people if we would only believe in you. So God, I pray that you would give ears to hear this morning, eyes to see, hearts to behold the wonders of this truth, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. So just to to jump back into this and kind of set the stage a little bit as we as we walk through just to give you some context so if you if you look back into chapter 10 kind of what precedes this chapter we, we find out that Jesus has, has has basically fled Jerusalem there was a threat uh, he was there was an attempted stoning that he escaped he got out of Dodge and he goes and he's probably there's a little bit of a debate on on where exactly John the Baptist ministry was but he's in the region that that John the Baptist had had ministered in and and at least my my take on that debate is that he's far to the northeast so he's, he's northeast of uh, the Sea of Galilee, very, very far north from Jerusalem, and a significant journey away. And so he's there, he is ministering there, but word travels up to where he is that Lazarus is ill, his, his friend is ill. And Lazarus and his sister Mary and Martha, they lived in a town called Bethany. That was a village that was just you know, shy of two miles or so uh, south of Jerusalem. And so, again, he's a significant distance away when this word comes um, that his friend is ill. And so as as we walk through this text, as we consider just the impact of the resurrection in this chapter and the way that Jesus really embodies the resurrection, there are kind of four scenes to this, or kind of four acts or four movements of this narrative that I want us to see. And the first one is just this. First, we see love's delay. 
loves delay. Probably not words we often associate together, uh, but that's what we see Jesus doing here. So look look back at verse uh, 3. You see the sisters that sent to him, they're saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. And Jesus hears it and says, this illness does not lead to death. It's for the glory of God, that the Son of, Man, Son of God may be glorified through it. And then in verse 5 again, we get that Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus. It becomes very clear as we read chapter 11 that, that Jesus was close friends with Lazarus and, and with his sisters Mary and Martha. And this tells us something really important about Jesus that I think we need to understand. Jesus was not some sort of unattached, aloof, kind of creative genius person out there who didn't have friends and who just, frankly, was weird, right? He wasn't this great teacher that was unapproachable or unpersonable. He was a normal person. He entered into friendships and relationships like everyone. He had friends. He had people that he enjoyed, people that he was close to, people that he felt safe with, people people he felt comfortable with. And so the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. They, they did that because they had just a bold confidence. They knew that, that Jesus cared about Lazarus, that he loved him. And they knew that he would want to know if something was happening to him. And so they believed also that he would do something to help. So they, there was a reason for that confidence. They, they felt secure in that friendship and that relationship. And really, John, is, is John, the, the writer of this gospel, is, is underlining this point. It's almost like if you're sleeping, like he's going to do it multiple times. You see there in verse 3, right? Lord, he whom you love is ill. Verse 5, in case you missed it, Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. And so he's, he's going to great pains to say, listen, Jesus loved them. And, and certainly those three were people that must have believed in him and believed in his mission and he, in turn, had opened up his heart to them in love. And just before we get any further, just want you to, to see this, friends. It's the same for you if you were a true believer in Jesus Christ. He doesn't call you an enemy anymore. He calls you friends. Jesus loves you. It's not just like a children's song that we sing. Like Jesus loves you. All of your quirks and your personality traits and your strengths and your weaknesses. He loves you as you are. We, we don't know a whole lot about Lazarus, but we get a decent portrait of, of a Mary and Martha here in another gospel. And Martha seems to be this person who, um, Mary and Martha are very different. Martha is this, this whirlwind kind of woman, always busy, maybe a little bit impulsive, worried on the anxious side. And so like we see when she finds out that Jesus is coming, she runs out of the house to go out and meet him, while Mary, on the other hand, is very different. She hears the same news, and she just stays put. She's there. And she seems to be quiet and just likes to be maybe to herself and, and sit still. It, and Jesus, so it doesn't matter to Jesus kind of what the personalities are. Just see that. Jesus loves them both, and he loves their brother. He welcomed them as family. He loved them. And friends, he does the same for, for all of his children who know him. He loves you as you are. Some of you can't get along with each other, right? Like some of you rub each other the wrong way. There's people in your families, right, that rub each other the wrong ways, right? Jesus is not like that. He takes you, he welcomes you in even as you are. And I think one of the reasons John is going out of his way to describe Jesus' love for them is because of what happens next. Verse 6 is somewhat startling, so when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Now, surely this was totally confusing to them. Jesus' immediate response to the fact that his friend was ill was, was in verse 5, right? This illness doesn't lead to death, for, or verse 4 rather. This illness doesn't lead to death. It's for the glory of God. So the Son of God may be glorified through it. And so surely when he said that, they thought, okay, he's going to heal his friend. Makes sense, right? Like, if, if me or you said that, it wouldn't mean anything, but, <coughs> excuse me, but Jesus is the son of God, right? He's got all power. We've seen him in other gospels raise the dead. He's done all sorts of other things. And so surely they thought, well, he's going to do something about this. Instead, though, we get verse five. Well, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so... In other words, or therefore, you could translate the Greek, same, same uh, you know, it could be translated either ways, and it is in many places. So, or therefore, because he loved them, he delayed his departure. 
Isn't that strange and interesting? Like, you don't do that, right? If you love someone, you don't delay coming to them when they are ill. If you heard a friend was dangerously sick, you would drop what you were doing and you would get there, especially if you were some distance away. You would say, man, I've got to get in the car and go now. And they didn't have a car to jump into, right? But it's only after hanging around where they are for two more days that finally Jesus says in verse 7, let's go to Judea again. And they must have been thinking, now? Now's the time you're going to go? I mean, really, right? And so they're, they're confused. They urge him not to go because, again, Jerusalem was a place he about got stoned, and they got to be thinking about him and also themselves, right? They don't want to get caught up in that fracas. Nobody wants to die. And so they, they kind of are, are trying to talk him out of it. They're urging him not to go. And then after some confusion, finally he says to them, look, y'all, Lazarus has died, and for your sake, this is verse 14 and 15, for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there so that you would believe. So let's go to him. And so step back from this, and here's what I want you to see. In all of this, what we see is that Jesus delays going to Lazarus precisely because he loves him. Precisely because he loves not just him, but his sisters. And because Jesus loves his disciples. See, Jesus in this instance was up to something bigger than just healing Lazarus, which if he had wanted to do, honestly, we see this in other places, right? He can do this without even going there. Does Jesus have the power to heal Lazarus just from where he is? Well, sure, absolutely, right? But no, he decides for the glory of God that he is going to go to him. He's operating on his own timeline, and of course, the fact that Jesus chooses this means there are all sorts of things that happen, right? You've got, you've got Mary and, and Martha who are crushed in the anguish of grief, right? You've got the whole village <clears throat> who is mourning with him. You've got uh, Jerusalem, people from Jerusalem coming down to, to try to care for him. I mean, it's unbelievable the, the response that happens here. Let me get this so you guys can actually listen and I can make it through here. So, but again, Jesus understands. He knows what he is doing. He sees the end from the beginning and he knows what he is up to. He's actually working for their good, even when it doesn't seem that way. And he's working for his great glory. And so what seemed to them like a delay was actually the means by which he would serve them. Love, in this case, delays. And friends, it's the same way with us. Jesus' resurrection power that we celebrate with such joy today doesn't mean that we will not experience pain and suffering in this world. It doesn't mean that something is not going to happen that winds up feeling delayed from your perspective. Jesus can love you and yet delay things. But here's where there's great hope because death doesn't thwart his power. Nothing thwarts his power or his love towards you. And so in life, you may not understand why. That's what we want to know, right? Why? Why is this happening? It's because we don't see the picture like he does. We don't understand, it. We don't understand what is ultimately good for us and what is ultimately most glorifying to him. But he does. He's the one that causes, as Romans 8 says, he causes all things to work together for the good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That's a promise specifically for believers, for those who are called according to his purpose. Those, those are for Christians. If you're not a Christian here, that promise does not apply to you. But if you're in Christ, it, it most certainly does. He's working things out for his glory and for your good. And his will ultimately cannot be broken and his love for you will not falter, even when it seems to be delayed. So that's the first scene, love's delay. Second scene is faith's declaration. Faith's declaration. Look in verse 17. We see that by now this, this a delay had been pretty substantial. He comes and he, he gets there in verse 17. He finds that, that Lazarus has already been in the tomb for four days. We'll come back to that. That four days is, is significant. But by now, there's this throng of, of mourners that have come around the family. Ju Jewish funeral custom of the time specified that when somebody died, 
Even if you were a poor family, you should hire at least two flute players to come and, and play. You should hire at least one professional wailing woman to come and to, to help grieve the death appropriately. It was just a custom. That's what they did. And we, we see the fact that Mary in chapter 12 is, is, uh, is breaking something of great value suggests that, and the fact that there's tons of people coming down from Jerusalem, suggests that there's a pro, they're a prominent family, maybe of some means. And so surely they have more than even those kind of bare uh, requirements. Lots of people are here grieving this. This is quite the scene. Extended family, villagers, friends from Jerusalem, professional mourners, the whole thing. But when we meet with Martha, finally, we see that, that her faith in Jesus is ultimately unshaken. She says in verse 21, Lord, if, Jesus, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. I don't think that's an accusation like we might could read that. I think she's just expressing her confidence and faith in him. She, she knows, she trusts, she's not shaken in him. She's not doubting him or angry with him. She's just expressing her confidence and trust in who he is. And even you see a little bit of that in verse 22, that even whatever now, whatever you ask from God, God's going to give you. Mary is convinced that Jesus is in this special relationship with the Father, and, and she's absolutely right about that. And so Jesus uh, makes a promise to her in verse 30, 23 that her brother will rise again, right? And she... She doesn't really, I don't think, realize you know, the, how soon that that's actually going to be the case. So Martha says to him, yeah, I, I know he's going to rise on the, on the last day, in the resurrection on the last day. Again, she's expressing her hope in the final resurrection. She's looking forward to that day. But what actually happens next in this passage is beautiful. Because Jesus is going to take her abstract, kind of out there hope in a future resurrection that's out there someday, somewhere, and he's going to explain that the resurrection and the life are actually personal. It's personal. Look at verse 25. This is where Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. See, the resurrection and life are not just abstract concepts that are out there. It's a person. It has flesh and blood. Jesus, when, in John 6, when he says that he is giving them the, the bread of heaven and that he himself is the bread of life, he is showing them that, again, the bread of life is ultimately a person. In John 8, when Jesus comes and lights the darkness of our world because he himself is the light of the world. Again, the light is a person. It's not just some abstract light out there. It's him. And so when Jesus resurrects and gives life, it's because he himself is the resurrection and the life. There is neither resurrection or life outside of Jesus. And so in this passage where Jesus is meeting with her, he affirms her faith. He doesn't smash her. He doesn't say, silly woman, you don't get it. He doesn't do that at all. He takes her deeper into the truth of who he is. He ultimately says, listen, the resurrection and the life is me. Do you know me? And that's what he asks her. Verse 26, do you believe this? Everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And friends, just to step out of this for a second, it's a question that he asks her, but it's a question that all of us need to answer as well. Do you, friend, do you believe this? Do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? Maybe you're here this morning and you have doubts about Jesus. Or maybe you're here and you believe, you have fond thoughts of Jesus, but you have yet to really commit your life to following him. And your life bears no transformation. Looks like everybody else out there in the world that's not the way it works when you come to Jesus. Because consider, consider what we said earlier. Death is undefeated. Your expected lifespan, maybe it goes up from 75 to 95 or 105 or something through medical advances. But so what at the end of the day? Because the scripture says that for man it's been appointed to die once and after that comes judgment. 
And so the issue is not what you know or what kind of fond thoughts you might harbor about Jesus. You might believe true things about him. But what have you done with those things? Because the belief that Jesus is talking to her about and the belief that we must have to follow Jesus is a transformative belief. It's not just knowing things intellectually. It's about committing your life to following him. It's about turning from one way of living to turning to a completely different way of living that seeks to magnify his goodness and greatness. And so I would just ask you, have you surrendered your life to him? Have you seen you cannot be good on your own? You get frustrated by, by trying to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and try to solve all your problems. Friend, let me just tell you and save you the frustration and the energy. You're never going to be able to do that. You're always going to get worn out and frustrated trying to make your life fly right on your own because you can't. You can't. You are not big enough and strong enough and you are not God ultimately. Maybe with you it's this lingering sense of unworthiness or condemnation. The sin that is entangling you just bothers and afflicts your conscience and you just can't seem, no matter what you do, you can't seem to get rid of that. Friend, would you trust in the grace that's provided in the cross of Jesus? And you will find forgiveness and joy and peace at the end of the day. Whoever believes in Jesus, he tells her, if you believe in me, though he die, though she die, yet shall he live. And so what we see there is Jesus, you know, believing in Jesus and accepting him as, as Savior that doesn't mean that you won't physically die. It doesn't mean that. Many of us here have buried loved ones, right? Buried loved ones who love Jesus. And so that doesn't mean that you won't die. And even Lazarus in this story, guess what? Lazarus is going to die again. He's going to be put back in a different tomb at a different time, right? But here's the thing. Even though we die physically, if you believe, because you believe in Christ and because he is the resurrection, Yet you will live. Your soul will not actually see death and your soul will not face judgment because Jesus has already done that in your place. And the church, I would say on this Easter Sunday, do you believe that? Do you believe that? Because believing that will transform your life in your heart. would love to talk to you more about that. Mary, in response to that question, declares her faith boldly, confidently. She says to him, yes, Lord, verse 27, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who's coming into the world. Brothers and sisters, we could do really well if we would follow the example of, of this faithful woman who in the face of death, again, before the miracle, she doesn't know the end of the story. We do, right? She doesn't know what's coming. We would do well if we followed her example and did not abandon hope and we trusted the way she trusted. Third scene, we saw love's delay, face decoration. Now we see Jesus' disgust. Jesus is disgust. After her faithful deco decoration in verse 28, she goes to Mary in private. She's probably looking to, to find some alone time for her sister with Jesus amidst all the commotion, all the noise, all the people that have come in. But when, she, when Mary then goes out to where Jesus is, the crowd, probably well-intentioned, like, oh, she's, she's going out to the tomb to mourn. Well, let's go with her. Let's comfort her. Let's be around her. She doesn't need to be alone right now, right? And so they follow with her. And so what probably she would have liked to have done in private actually happens with watching eyes around her. You know, moms, y'all can relate to this, right? <laughs> it's like, man, you can't get a moment's privacy, a moment's silence, especially moms with young kids, right? Man, I'm going to go to the bathroom. I'm going to go to my car. I'm going to shut myself in the walk-in closet, like whatever. Like you're trying to find peace and quiet, you can relate to Mary here in this situation, right? Mary comes out to Jesus. She, he, she falls at his feet. She says to him, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Same thing her sister said, right? Again, I don't think there's a hint of accusation or, or sideways with Jesus. She's just expressing confidence. She's saying, I, I wish you could have been here, and this outcome would have been different. But notice Jesus' response to her in this moment. It says, when Jesus saw her weeping, and he sees the Jews that were, had come with her who are also weeping, he's deeply moved in his spirit, and he's greatly troubled. 
And he says, where have you laid him? And they said, Lord, come and see. And then the, the famous verse, Jesus wept. J.C. Ryle, older, a pastor from a different generation, says that in no part of Jesus' ministry do we, do we see him acting so clearly as both fully man and fully God as at this moment. He is both man in his sympathy with them and he is God in his raw power that he uses to raise Lazarus. I think Ryle's right. Seeing the scene around him, seeing his dear friend Mary overcome with grief, Jesus himself is overcome. And, and we know verse 35 because it's the shortest verse in the Bible. Congratulations, you just memorized the verse of scripture. Jesus wept if you got that one, right? But understand this, like Jesus is a man of sorrows. He's one who is acquainted with grief. And, and just think about your own life and the hurts and the pains that you experience. Jesus is not oblivious to those things, okay? Jesus is not unaware of your hurts and your weaknesses and your sorrows. He sympathizes with us in those things. He's like us in every way except he was without sin, Hebrews says. So be encouraged by that, saints. And thankfully, not only does he sympathize with us as a man, he's also God who can do something about these things. That's good news for us, but there's something more than, than just sorrow here. If you look at, at, um, at, uh, at verse 33, the, verse, uh, yeah, verse 33, it says that he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. That word deeply moved, at least in the ESV that I'm reading from, has a, has a footnote. If you go down to the footnote, it says it, it can mean he was indignant. And that idea of indignance is, is closer actually to what the Greek says. The deeply moved is kind of a nice way of kind of cleaning it up and, and making, uh, making it nicer. The, the word in the Greek, actually, if you look at the way it's used in secular literature from the time, it's used to refer to the snorting of horses, like when horses are mad and they're snorting, stomping their feet. And so then when it's brought over and it's used to, to apply to human emotions, the sense is anger or indignation or disgust. And so when, again, in the, in the English it says, or the ESV, it says he's deeply moved. It'd be better to say he's indignant or he's disgusted. He's looking at the situation and he's angry. And so that begs the question, well, what is he disgusted by? Is he disgusted by this, this scene with all the elaborate mourning and the flute players and these, you know, no, there's no hint of that. That was just the custom. That's just what they did. There's no sense that that was what he was upset about. Was he upset at the profound despair that they were going on and on like there was no hope? Well, certainly not, because again, what else would you expect at death? He hasn't yet risen from the grave, and so there was no real hope except for the hope that Mary is expressing, you know, way out there, or Martha, rather, is expressing way out there in the future. And so I think, actually, his disgust here is, is focused on just the sin-sick, broken world that has created this space where they are then where death is reigning. And he, in that moment, as both God and man, as he is there with his friends, and this whole scene is crushed and broken by the reality of what sin has wrought in our world. That there is such a thing as death. Because death is a bitter reality. It's a painful reality. His friend is laying not too far from there, dead and cold, lying in a cave. And Jesus, of all people, knows this was not the way that this whole thing was supposed to be. And so he is angry and indignant, disgusted by the way <laughs> that the broken world has unfolded. And, and frankly, this even speaks to us because in our culture, I think we tend to, just to help ourselves cope, I guess, we tend to shrug off death, right? We, we use um, kind of silly euphemisms, to uh, describe death, right, like uh, somebody kicked the bucket, right? Or I was just Googling some of these just to, to be more creative and a couple funny ones I ran across. Like somebody is checking into the Horizontal Hilton, right? They're uh, checking into the Motel Deep Six. You know, like, we, like we, we, we do things like that in our popular culture to make ourselves feel better about the reality and the pain of death. And, and y'all, we do it as Christians too. Like we do whatever we can to avoid using the D word that someone has died, so we'll say, man, they passed away. Or if they're Christians, we'll say, man, they've gone to be with the Lord. 
I'm not saying you shouldn't do that or that's sinful, but, but, but honestly, you get the feeling at some funerals and around some things that, that death is just kind of part of life, right? Like this is natural, you know, this is just what happens. But that's not the way that Jesus reacts to death. He doesn't react that way. He doesn't pretend like everything is okay, like it's natural. He doesn't just sweep it under the rug. It's profoundly unnatural. Death is a sign of the brokenness and the curse of this world. And so it's right when someone dies to grieve and to, to mourn, even the, to, to grieve bitterly, to be broken over that loss. Even for those of us that grieve in hope of a resurrection, it's still okay. So Jesus was outraged in his spirit. He was troubled. And that, that word for troubled here is the same word that gets used in the upper room. So he's washing the disciples' feet. 12, 1331, uh, 1321 says that Jesus was troubled in his spirit. And then he testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And so he's torn up emotionally. He's angry. He's troubled. He's in deep anguish and pain as he comes to Lazarus' tomb. He hates death. And he hates the sin that caused it. And so, friend, I would say if you are here on this Easter Sunday and you're frustrated by the brokenness of this world. I don't know if you've heard the news this morning, but Sh Sri Lanka, off the little country off the southern tip of India, Christians there have been massacred as they were coming to Easter services. It's a sign of brokenness in our world. It's crushing. And so if you're here and you're crushed by those things, the brokenness and pain that happens, and if it seems like the things in your life are not getting better, circumstances seem like they're not changing, Friend, let me just tell you, I can't, I can't tell you that it's all going to be better, and I certainly don't have the power to make it better. I wish I did. But what I can tell you with confidence is, is that no one hates it worse than our sovereign creator. No one hates it more than Jesus and the Father, that this broken world is what it is. And the good news is, is that he is eager to make all things new, and he is doing exactly that. And that's the last scene I want to take us to, because what we finally see is death's death. Death's death. Jesus arrives at the tomb. He is overcome by disgust and grief. Again, same word is being used there in verse 38 again. He's deeply moved. He's, he's indignant. He's outraged. And as was common, just common burial practice, he was put in a, in a cave. Stone was rolled in front of it. And Jesus, this is interesting to me, Jesus asked them to, to roll away the stove. He's, stone, rather. He's getting ready to raise a dead man he says, hey, can y'all can y'all move the stone? He's just focused, right? He's doing one thing. He's raising the dead, and I guess he wants to um, wait for that moment to show what he's actually going to do. So they roll back the stone. Or actually, before that, though, you've got, you've got Mary, or got Martha, rather. And it's funny how John keeps reminding us that somebody has died, right? Martha gets referred to as the sister of the dead man, right? So just reminding you, he is dead. He is in the tomb. And pointing to that is Martha's response. Martha protests. Jesus says, hey, roll, roll it back. And Martha's like, Jesus, are you crazy? It's going to smell. He's been in there four days now. This is not good. Now, I said we come back to the four days. In, in common rabbinical teacher, the teaching of the Jewish rabbis in that time, they thought, there's no biblical warrant for this, all right? So this is extra biblical, but this is just the thought in those days. They thought that the soul would, would hover after death, the soul would hover near the body um, for a period of time, and then the soul would go away. And normally the soul would go away, they believed, once there were visible signs of decomposition. In other words, once decay in the body is setting in, that's when the soul would leave for good. And that happened on the fourth day. That's usually when visible decomp would actually begin to show itself. And so just think about this. Why is it now the fourth day that all these things are happening? It's because back to the beginning, right? Jesus delayed. Jesus delayed. He took his time. By, by this time, again, there was no question of whether uh, Lazarus was really dead or not, right? He smelled he was dead. Soul has departed. If a miracle was going to happen, it was not going to be some kind of resuscitation, right? It's not like, hey, let's do some CPR on him and give him some chest compressions and like maybe he'll come back to life, right? No, that's not what's going to happen. So we see all this. Jesus is delaying his visit 
because of his love for Lazarus and for Mary and for Martha and for the disciples and for saints of all ages, including us, so that we would behold and understand his great power and understand his power over death without any kind of question. I mean, a man was four days dead, the corpse has already become corrupt, and that man was made alive? I mean, come on, right? And so he prays in verse 41, he says, listen, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I know you always hear me, but I said this on account of people standing here, that they would believe that you sent me. And so we get a glimpse here of the constant communion that Jesus has with the Father in his earthly life. Like, he's already talked to God about all of this. He's not praying like, hey, God, can we do this? You know, can I do this resurrection thing? We good? No, he's praying for the sake of others that they would see this union that they have, this relationship between the Father and the Son. He's peeling back the curtain on their relationship. And so when he said these things, he cries out with his loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And then to the amazement of everybody, in some ways, this is one of the most remarkable words in Scripture. Lazarus, come out. And then verse 44, the man who had died, what? He came out. He came out. His hand and feet were bound with linen strips, his face wrapped up in a cloth. I mean, imagine the scene there. There was shock and probably fear. I mean, I've been running. I'm like, what in the world is going on? Joy, wonder. The grave had been forced to give up its tenant. Jesus says to them, unbind him and let him go. Friends, do you see the reason that Easter brings us such joy is because though none of us were standing there at Lazarus' tomb, that empty tomb that exists outside of Bethany, because of an even greater empty tomb, the same words that Jesus spoke to Lazarus might be said to us, to us who are in bondage of sin and death, to us who have been held captive by sin, who have been enslaved in our rebellion against our maker, feeling the crushing weight of divine condemnation hanging over us without hope and without God in the world. Do you see, Lazarus' empty tomb pointed to an even greater empty tomb, the empty tomb of Jesus. Lazarus, when, he, when he, all this happens, Lazarus stumbles out of the grave, right? He's bound up in his grave clothes. Hands and feet are bound. Vision obscured by his faith cloth, face cloth was probably trying to figure out what in the world was going on here. And again, one day he would enter another grave. Jesus, though, when Jesus walked out of the grave, he left his grave clothes behind. He was in a glorified body, glorified clothing. He left his clothes back neatly folded, if you read the accounts. He wasn't in an earthly body, but a glorified one. His mission was done. There was no obscured vision. There was no confusion on his part about what was happening. The mission was accomplished. He'd paid for sin, drank the cup of God's wrath. He'd secured life and freedom for everyone. It was finished. And when Jesus lived, as he walked out, death died. Death's victory was vanquished. Its sting was stolen. Jesus was alive. And then the words that he spoke to Lazarus in that moment, he speaks by extension to us. He says to us, come out, come out, unbind them, let them go. Friend, again, I would ask you, do you know the resurrection power and life of Jesus? Because your life does not have to be what it once was. Your life does not have to be what it is even right now. You don't have to live in the bondage of your sins. You don't have to live in bondage of the sins maybe that your parents, the things that they did to you or other people have done against you. You don't have to live in slavery to the approval of other people or to the idols of comfort or of power, needing to be in charge or have control or to be performing all the time and pleasing other people. Whatever secret addiction it might be that's controlling you, that nobody here knows but you. Friend, the broken relationship that looms so large in your life or the pain that exists there, whatever the brokenness that you have, whatever the pain or the bondage that is yours, that you clean up so nice and that you bury deep within. Friend, Jesus says to you, come out of that. Be loosed from that and be let go. He desires to set captives free. He desires to give you life. And maybe you would say to me, well, you don't understand. 
Maybe you feel like you're this own version of Lazarus, right? It's, it's already gone on too far. You're too far gone. You feel like your own personal version of being four days in the grave. Like, man, nobody's coming back after four days. You think, man, God can't save me. God can't change this mess. Listen, you saw what Jesus did to Lazarus, did you not? How he brought resurrection to that. And he can do the same thing to wounded and hurting hearts. He forgives and he restores and he heals and he gives life. And because Jesus is the resurrection and the life, that means that you are now free to live both now and forever. Both now in this life, life abundant and forever. Though you will one day die physically, if you are in Christ, you have already begun to live forever spiritually And the scripture says that your life is hidden with Christ in God and with his resurrection. And so that therefore you will be raised as well. And so because Jesus lives, you have been free to live. You've been free to love. You are free to forgive those who have hurt you. You're free to serve. If you belong to him and the resurrection is true, then what can stop you? Friends, nothing can stop you in this life because of the resurrection power of Jesus. What can trip you up? Nothing can. Because you've already begun to live forever in the resurrection power of Jesus. And so friends, because the resurrection is true, because Easter is real, because Jesus walked out of the tomb, live boldly, share the gospel freely, fight sin diligently, I love a song I've been playing on my playlist, and here's what it says. Let there be dancing in the darkness. Let our song break through the night. Lift your voice and sing that Christ is king. Because Jesus is alive. No more condemnation, no more doubt and fear. For our sin and shame, they have no power here. In his resurrection, perfect love has set the captives free. Praise the risen king who stands in victory. All you brokenhearted, all you worn and weak, Come find living water, everlasting streams. To the wandering spirit, lost and searching, wanting something more. Find the risen king who overcomes the world. Friends, these things are true. Jesus is alive. Of what Chuck Colson uh, said. Chuck Colson, who was uh, put in jail for his participation in Watergate. He says, the way I know resurrection is true is because back then with Watergate, we couldn't keep a secret about anything. And you think these 12 guys who, who whatever could, could uh, or they, we couldn't have lied about anything. So do you think these 12 guys could have hatched this scheme and lied about it for so long? No, it wouldn't happen. Friends, the resurrection of Jesus is true and it has transformed our lives. And I encourage you as a resurrected people, if you have faith in Jesus, to go live forth in the power of his resurrection.